and welcome to Classic Cars. The Mini is celebrating its 40th birthday this year, so we're chatting to the man who put his name on the car, John Cooper, and I'll be joining in the fun at Kerbera Sprint Circuit for the National Cooper Day. Picturesque Bewley Village in the New Forest is home to the National Motor Museum. Lord Montague has been gathering cars for the collection for over 47 years. He started by using the hall of his stately home as a garage. In 1952, when I first opened Palace House to the public, I put in the front hall of the house, literally, which made the whole house smell of oil, um, a few old cars in memory of my father, who was a great pioneer motorist. In the early days, the cars that everybody was collecting was the veteran car, the very old Genevieve type. And then there were the sports cars of the 20s and 30s, and one or two press war cars, but very few. Now one has an enormous choice. Choosing cars for public consumption is a very difficult task, and an advisory board meets monthly to deliberate over which vehicles should join the collection. Museum director Michael Ware came here as a photographer back in the 60s. The greatest difficulty is what to leave out. We collect and display motoring on the roads of Great Britain. This is where I think a committee is important because you can then get a wide sense of opinion, whereas otherwise it could become my collection or Lord Montague's collection, you know, and with us just making the decision. We get offered a lot of cars and it's very disappointing the number that we have to turn down because we've either got one or it isn't quite the car we're looking for, or for sheer we haven't got the space. The museum's always had a very strong policy of using our cars. We are a live museum and not a dead mausoleum. And uh, hence that's why I rally cars all over the world. Cars were made to go, and uh, it's much better for them if their engines are started up and um, all circulate anyway. Lord Montague knows that many of today's cars could be the museum pieces of tomorrow. But one can see that uh, I think Morgan's, for instance, will, will continue to be a collector of pieces. Aston Martins, um, perhaps the latest Jaguar, certainly Ferrari. Uh, but the ordinary family car, has it got to prove that they really made an impact on the world of motion? A good example would be, first of all, the Volkswagen and the Mini. You can always say that any vehicle which is in limited production has always got a chance of becoming a museum piece for that, for that very reason. But whether uh, we should have a Mondeo or a Vectra or whatever, Golf, at the moment, I don't really know. I personally like to have 20 years of hindsight before making that decision. In two or three years' time, there will only be six or seven motor manufacturers in the world, and they will dominate the whole market. And individuality will depend on built on goodies and painting your car in psychedelic colours or something. Otherwise, it's going to be a very dull moving scene. To be honest, we're in the nostalgia business. Uh, a, a tremendous lot of our visitors are not motoring enthusiasts, but they remember the Herald, the A35, the Morris Minor, whatever it is, and they would expect to find it here. And that's very important. If you fill the place with oddball cars, which the enthusiast might love, your ordinary visitor would not appreciate the collection, I think, as much as they do. After the break, we go Cooper crazy, and I take a sprint in a racing mini. Think of the 60s, think of the Mini, intended as a cheap, ultra-practical car of the future. Until John Cooper came along. Cooper was at the forefront of the motor racing industry, and spotting the Mini's sporting potential assured worldwide recognition for decades to come. As soon as the Mini sort of came out, you know, sort of my drivers, Bruce McLaren, Jack Brabham, and Salvadori, they bought, we bought them, or gave them to them, and they put Formula Junior engines in them, they didn't stop because they had drum brakes at that time. And they were fantastic. You know, they, they realized it was the first really saloon car, family saloon car, that handled like a sports car. Anyway, we took one up. We went up well, I actually went up and saw Harriman, the chairman of PMC, and Lissy Gonitz, and said, why can't we build some of these for the boys? He said, well, take one away and do it. And I took it back with disc brakes and a remote gear shift and a Formula Junior engine. And Harriman drove it and thought it was fantastic. And I said, well, 
you've got to make a thousand of them to get it homologated. He said, we'll never sell a thousand. I said, I think you will. Anyway, um, it went into production, the 997, that's this one. And uh, the thousand sold in the first week. So it was wonderful, really. After we realized how good it was, we then produced the S, which was full homologation bits, you know. And the, the, the first S came out in 1963 and Paddy won the 64 Monty with it. That was the start of the, the big thing with the S. And then later we brought more S's out. The day's top honors, in fact, the Rally World's top award goes to Timo Mackinnon and co-driver Paul Easter. For them, it's been a wet, cold, windy, and wonderful. We did actually, well, you know, we won the Monte Carlo Rally four times, but the third time, we was first, second and third overall and disqualified for having the headlamps dipping onto the spotlights so the French could win it. For previous Monte Carlo winner, Paddy Hopkirk and his team, a bitter disappointment. I remember once when we won the Tulip Rally, I went over with Isigonis afterwards and Tim O'Macken was going to take the members of the press round Zanfurt and he said, come on Cooper, you t I take you first, so I got in the car with him and it was a bit damp and he was the left foot braking man, you know, he started this left foot braking. And we were doing about 100 miles an hour, and he said, now I make mini understeer, now I make mini oversteer. And he was sort of like this, and it was almost going over the edge, you know. And I was absolutely petrified. And we came back, and I thought, thank God that's over. And he said, now we do proper lap. <laughs> what were the characteristics of the car that made it handle so well? Why did it seem to be so perfect for racing? Well, several things really. A wheel at each corner, number one. And of course the east-west engine front wheel drive, which was the first one, is you this, the Mini was the first car to do that. And now 95% of the world car manufacturers have got east-west front wheel drive cars. They've all copied him. So he must have been right, mustn't he? How did he feel about Coopers for racing at first. At first, he was a great kid, Aristigonis. You know, he loved it really because he's a racing man. But he used to make out, I, de I designed it for the district nurse, you know, and that sort of thing. But he loved it really. I mean, his whole life was motor cars. He loved motor cars. Everything. To, I mean, he, we, if you go out, go out to lunch, he'd draw on the tablecloth, draw all over the tablecloth, suspension or something, and he'd say, put the tablecloth on the bill and take it back put it on Jack Daniel's drawing board in the experimental department there and say, oh, draw that and make that and do that. that. That sort of thing, you know. Some of the things on the Mini are so, that he did were so great. I mean, he put the instrument console in the center, so you left and right hand drive. It's quite simple. He had sliding windows because it was five inches wider inside. You know, I mean, you could, a, a six foot seven man can still go drive the Mini because his knees come up each side of the steering wheel and where the window used to go, you can stick your knees, you know, and that sort of thing. They were very worried at the time that it was going to be a success, and they wouldn't spend the money on the tooling, because body tooling is a very expensive business, having uh, robots to hold the body panels up. And labor was pretty cheap in, you know, in those days. So he designed, Esiganis designed the body with those ribs along the side. And four men arrived with the side panels, put them up, clipped them together and swap welded them instead of having an elaborate body jig to hold them together. And they, they were going to change that after two years, but they're still using it now. And the Mini's appeal has never faded, as fashionable as ever. Stereophonics paying their tribute with more than a nod towards that classic homage to the Mini Cooper, the Italian job. Do you think, though, that people's enthusiasm for them will ever wane? No, never. I mean, when you think there are thousands of mini clubs all over the world, New Zealand, Australia, Hong Kong, Germany, France, everywhere, you know, the mini clubs, which is great. And I mean, you get other cars that have one mini club in each country, possibly, but this is, they're great, you know, and they meet, they meet always meeting every weekend somewhere, a mini club.